Hey guys, what's up? It's Savannah. Welcome back to my channel. And for today's video, we are back with another true crime video on my YouTube channel. As you can tell by the title of today's video, we are talking about the unsolved disappearance of Kimberly Moreau. This case was highly requested by you guys in the comments of my latest videos, as well as in my podcast email, which if you guys didn't know, you can listen to the audio version of this on my podcast, which is called Killer Instinct. It is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. The link is always in the description box below, so you guys can go check it out and if you do have a theory on this case you can send that into my podcast email which is killerinstinctpodcast at gmail.com and on the podcast we go over theories from the previous cases that I have talked about. So before we move on to the rest of the episode, you guys, I want to take a quick second and talk to y'all about Zola. Now, this is for all of my people who are either getting engaged, plan to be engaged, guys, girls, listen up. It is engagement season. And listen, I've never planned a wedding before, but I have been around people who have planned weddings. And from what I can tell and from what I have witnessed, it is a very, very stressful process. However, if you are engaged or in the market of planning a wedding, there is something out there that can help make the wedding planning process a lot less stressful. So I want to talk to you guys real quick about Zola. Zola makes wedding planning so much easier. From wedding invites to registries to guest list managers, it's all in one place and it makes everything so much less stressful. You can create your wedding website in literally minutes. It is so easy with Zola's process and they have hundreds of designs for you to choose from. They have really cool website features like a little FAQ page. So if you want a nice way to tell your guests that kids are not invited to your wedding, this is the way to do it. Zola provides you with an online RSVP page for your wedding website as well as it links your wedding registry on your website as well. Guests can shop your wedding registry right on your website that you create through Zola. Not only that though, Zola has the highest rated registry of all time. You can register for gifts, experiences, and honeymoon fun. And they have gorgeous, beautiful, and affordable wedding invites and you can shop their paper suites from save the dates and thank you cards too. And all of these things are designed to help match your wedding website and Zola will help you keep track of your addresses and RSVPs all in one place. Zola has helped over 1 million couples get married and they will help you just as well. So what you're going to do is you're going to go to Zola.com slash killer today and you're going to use the promo code save 50 to get 50% off your save the date. You can also get a free personalized paper sample before for you purchase so you know what you're getting. Again, that is 50% off your save the dates if you go to zola.com slash killer and enter the code save50. So I think that's all I have to say today before we get into this case. So with that being said, let's just jump right on into it. Kimberly Moreau was born on January 21st of 1969. She was last seen wearing a white blouse as well as blue jeans and white high top sneakers as well as a man's class ring that was engraved with the words Mike 87 and Mike Staples. Kimberly is a Caucasian female. She has blonde hair and blue eyes. And a distinguishing feature about Kimberly is that she has a surgical scar on her back. She also has her right ear pierced three times and her left ear is pierced four times. So Kimberly lived in Maine. She actually lived in J Maine to be more specific with her parents Richard and Pat. Unfortunately, her mother Pat ended up passing Away two years after her disappearance from cancer. Kimberly was also the youngest of three daughters, so she had two older sisters. Kimberly loved writing poetry and she participated in gymnastics and cheerleading at her school. She attended Jay High School and she had dreams of becoming a model when she graduated and she has also been a contestant in beauty pageants. Kimberly went missing on May 10th, 1986. She went missing on the night of May 10th and in the early morning hours of May 11th. So the night of May 10th, Kimberly was actually supposed to go to her junior class prom. So it was prom night. She was in her junior year of high school. She was planning to go to this prom, but her and her boyfriend actually got into a pretty big argument that night. And her boyfriend's name is Mike Staples, which if you're wondering why she was wearing a class ring with the engravement of Mike 87, that is why. It's because Mike Staples was her boyfriend at the time. So her and Mike ended up getting into a pretty big argument, which made her change her plans. So instead of going to the prom, she actually got 
got together with a friend. Now this friend is named Rhonda Breton and Rhonda and Kimberly had plans to go and hang out with these two older men. Now these men were about 25 years old. So before heading out, it was about 11 o'clock at night on May 10th and she ended up going back to her house. Kimberly did. She ended up going back to her home and gathering her belongings and the only other person home at that time was one of her sisters. So Kimberly actually ended up telling her sister that she was going out. She was only going to be gone for about an hour and then she would be coming right back home. Kimberly was last seen entering a late model white Pontiac Trans AM with one of the 25 year old men as well as Rhonda. What's bizarre about Kimberly's departure when she left her home is that she left with none of her belongings. She left her purse, she left her wallet, she left her keys, she didn't even bring a jacket and it was very cold outside at this time period so she was definitely planning on coming back. She didn't leave with any of her belongings that she would have needed if she was planning on staying out for a very long period of time or planning on not coming back to her house at all. So the 25 year old man, one of the 25 year old men that Kimberly was hanging out with that night is a man named Brian Edmond. Now Brian says that in the early morning hours of May 11th at about 3 45 a.m. he was driving with Kimberly and Rhonda and according to Brian he said that he was driving with the two of them and they were about a half a mile away from Kimberly's home and they were planning on driving Kimberly back to her home but according to Brian he said that Kimberly was visibly upset about the fight that she had gotten in with her boyfriend just several hours prior. So he said that when they were about a half a mile away from Kimberly's home, Kimberly demanded that Brian pull over so that way she could walk the rest of the way home. Brian said that he pulled over, let her out, and let her walk the rest of the way home, and he just drove away. And that was the last time anyone has ever seen Kimberly. The next morning when Kimberly didn't come home, her parents immediately called 911 to file a missing person's report but what's so frustrating about this case is that the police treated this case as a runaway case for the first four months of Kimberly's disappearance. They treated it as a runaway case. And for the entirety of those four months, Kimberly's family knew that that was not the case with this, especially her father, Richard. He especially knew that Kimberly was afraid of the dark. She was not going to ask to get out, to walk a half mile by herself home, considering the fact that not only was it dark outside, but it was 38 degrees outside and Kimberly did not have a jacket. Richard just refuses to believe the fact that Kimberly would do something like that because it's so out of character for her. But the fact that police treated this case as a runaway for the first four months really in hindsight pushes this case back because for those first four months there could have been so many things that happened to help try to find Kimberly and instead they had to delay and wait four months later and who knows what could have happened in that time frame if they had started their search and treated it as a missing persons case right away. And after the first four months they did change the case from a runaway to a missing and endangered person but it just makes you think like what could have happened in those four months had they not treated it as a runaway case. So Rhonda actually backs up and confirms Brian's story when he says that Kimberly asked to be let out of the car, said that she wanted to walk the rest of the way home, and that Brian just pulled over and let her get out and let her walk the rest of the way home and said that there was nothing more to it. What's also frustrating about this case is that we don't know what happened once Kimberly left her house at about 4 o'clock p.m. It is kind of, you know, a mystery as to where exactly they went. The four of them are suspected to have just kind of drove around all night into the town while drinking. There's also suspicions that they went to a teenage drinking party, like a house party, and drank there. There's just many different speculations and we're not exactly sure what exactly happened that night. I'm sure police do because they had to question and interrogate the people that were with Kimberly that night, but that information isn't released to the public yet. Richard does not believe Brian's story whatsoever. Richard actually believes that Kimberly was murdered within hours of leaving the house and Brian is actually considered a person of interest in Kimberly's disappearance, but he has never been charged directly with anything involving her going missing. Richard has actually stayed in contact with Brian over the years in hopes that Brian will in one way, shape, or form come forward to Richard and tell him exactly what has happened, but unfortunately that day has not come yet. In 2015, the police searched a five-acre property that belonged to Brian 
Fry and Edmund with hopes that maybe they could find some trace of Kimberly there or something that would show them where she was or if she was there at all but unfortunately their search efforts led to nothing. Richard has actually been extremely hands-on throughout this entire case and throughout the entirety of his daughter's disappearance. Richard actually has friends who are in the police department but Richard really has been navigating this case from day one and has been interviewing himself lots and lots of people. Police did use search and cadaver dogs and took them up and down Kimberly's street in hopes that maybe the dogs would pick up a scent or find something but unfortunately that search led to nothing as well. And they also did testing on Brian's car considering he was the one that was driving the car that night but those results haven't been released to the public yet. Something to also note is that the day after Kimberly's disappearance there was actually a concrete pad that was laid down onto a farm stand in the Livermore, Maine. And once this happened, there was a lot of speculation and a lot of rumors floating around that Kimberly could have actually been placed at the farm stand and then once the concrete was poured over her it would have been a reason for why no one was able to find her yet so there was a lot of rumors saying that that's actually where her body was located and in the most recent past couple years police have used the best technology in the game to try to rip up that slab and they have done so successfully however they have not been able to find any evidence that would suggest that Kimberly was there they were not able to find her body none of her belongings were there none of that so I want to talk about a man named Calvin Tidswell. Now Calvin Tidswell is a man who during the 1980s owned an arcade in the Livermore Falls, Maine, which was right next to the police station. That's where it was located. And because he owned an arcade, a lot of high schoolers and teenage kids would kind of make their way to the arcade. It was kind of like their hangout spot. That's where they would all go. And because of that, it really gave Calvin an in on hanging out with kids. They all became pretty close to Calvin and everything that I have read about Calvin in my research research has been extremely negative. People who went to high school with him described him as a bully who would physically, you know, beat people up and bully people. And when parents would call Calvin's parents to complain, Calvin's parents just kind of said, oh yeah, that's just how he is. That's who he is. People described it as his parents were actually afraid of him. And after he graduated high school, he grew on to own this arcade. People described him as being very manipulative and that for him, it was all about the control factor. He just wanted Wanted to know that he had control over everyone. He would manipulate them in any way that he could, use any different head game and mind game to kind of twist it into having people trust him and believe in him when really it was just his way of feeling like he had control over people. And a lot of people do believe that he used this arcade. He got the arcade when he was like 45 years old and a lot of people think that he used the arcade to lure kids in and be able to manipulate them. And there was actually a newspaper article released. I will try to pop it up on the screen if you're watching me on my YouTube channel that basically say, stated that Richard as well as police do believe that Calvin could have been involved in Kimberly's disappearance. Kimberly as well as Rhonda and Brian and the other man they were with that night could have gone to the arcade and spent time there which would have meant that Calvin would have been one of the last people to see Kimberly. Calvin has been in and out of jail for drug related charges but he has never been named by police as a person of interest or a suspect in Kimberly's disappearance. There are a lot of people who have their suspicions about Calvin and who believe that he could have possibly been one of the last people to see Kimberly the night she disappeared. Police believe that the last three people to see Kimberly that night were either Calvin Tidswell, Brian Edmond, or Mike Staples, her boyfriend. Rhonda, her girlfriend that she was with that night, kind of falls into the category of Brian because she was with Brian and Kimberly that night. But here we are over three decades later and there has been no real answers as to what happened to Kimberly that night. Richard, as well as Kimberly's sister, have come out and say that they don't believe that whatever happened to Kimberly that night was premeditated. They believe that whatever happened to Kimberly was more so on the side of being an accident. But even with that being said, they do want and deserve the answers as to what could have happened to her that night. And they know that there are people out there who know exactly what happened to Kimberly and they just want those answers for themselves. And as far as theories go on this one, I do want to talk about one theory that I have not seen in doing my research that is kind of one that I was just like waiting to read throughout all of this. And that is the theory that Mike Staples is involved in Kimberly's disappearance. 
experience. Now, the reason I think that this could have possibly been what happened is because it makes sense. The motive makes sense. If her and her boyfriend got into an argument and instead of going to the prom, she went off with these older men and her friend and were, was drinking and doing all these things and then came back home later, let's say Mike was either waiting for her at her house and wanted to talk and instead got super angry and one thing led to another and he ended up lashing out on Kimberly. He could have also heard that Kimberly was out and hanging out with older men and drinking and engaging in behavior that he didn't approve of or if he saw Kimberly get dropped off by Brian and then that sparked a trigger for him. It could have been multiple things and I think that the motive there is more clear than the motive that could have been with either Kelvin or Brian. When it comes to Brian, I think that I believe what Richard and Kimberly's sisters believe, which is that it was more so an accident. If that's the route that we're taking, that Brian was the one who was responsible for this. It's very possible that Kimberly could have overdosed on something. You know, she was young and if she had gone out drinking with Brian or ended up at the arcade and someone slipped her something or she tried a drug that she isn't used to and didn't know how her body would react to it. She is younger and could have been hanging out with people who are more experienced when it comes to drugs and alcohol so she could have been easily influenced by the people around her to try something she wouldn't normally try and if her body had a bad reaction to it that could definitely have happened and the people around her got nervous and didn't know what to do so they decided to just dispose of her body. When I was doing my research I was waiting for someone to talk more about Rhonda because I feel like Kimberly was with Rhonda the entire night, or Rhonda probably knows way more than she's letting on. I, I do feel like she's kind of the missing link in all of this, and I feel like she could probably fill in a lot of holes in this entire case, because there are so many holes in this. There are so many missing pieces in this. And this is one of those cases where, you know, we usually say like someone knows something, but we know then someone that knows something in this case. And that is Rhonda. Personally, I believe Rhonda is the missing piece in this. And I'm really hoping that she's able to come forward at some point and just be very honest about what happened. I think it's possible that someone could have scared Rhonda into not saying anything and not speaking out because she was younger. And if someone like Brian, or Calvin or someone who we don't know the name of yet could have said I like, don't say anything. There's just so many unanswered questions with this. Where did they go? Like what was the step-by-step -step process of what happened throughout the night of May 10th and the early morning hours of May 11th? I feel like police must know that information and it just hasn't been released to the public yet but as far as the public information that's available on this case it is very limited. The latest information on this case that has been released is that Richard, Kimberly's father, has said that there is a dying man who has come out and spoken on Kimberly's case and have given them some sort of tip or lead or hint as to what could have happened to Kimberly that night and they are trying to pursue and follow through with that tip but they haven't released that tip to the public yet we do not know what that is but according to Richard he says that they do believe that they are closer than ever to finding out what has happened to Kimberly and even that alone makes me question at least you know what dying man is coming forward and saying that he has information on Kimberly's case or a tip on Kimberly's case. Hopefully his tip follows through and he's able to help bring Kimberly's family some answers as to what could have happened. Richard has said countless times how much he just wants to know answers because when that happens there's only three things he wants. He wants to bring Kimberly home, bury her next to her mother and her grandmother, as well as have a celebration of her life and finally be able to celebrate the fact that they have brought their daughter justice. I feel like this case is unlike any we've ever covered before and I feel like that because of the lack of information that is out there but on the contrast of that it's like there is such a lack of information out there but we know that there are people out there who have all of the answers to the missing pieces that we're sitting here and kind of like going over in our heads and in our brains of trying to fit everything together we know there are people out there that know exactly what happened that night and they just don't want to come forward and say it so again i really do encourage you guys i'm just going to say it again i mention it a lot in these in these episodes that we talk about in these cases that we talk about there are anonymous tip lines that you can call if you are worried for your life or your family's life or someone that you know 
and you can give a tip as to what happened in a case or something that you know even if you don't think it's important it could be very very important and crucial all right you guys that is all for me today thank you so much for tuning in to another true crime episode here on my youtube channel if you are new here hi my name is savannah i make videos three days a week sunday tuesday thursday you should subscribe and join the family make sure if you want to listen to the podcast version of this you click that link in the description box below i will see you guys in a couple days with a brand new video bye guys